Hello? Hi. Good evening. Good evening, Porto. I hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first Above and Beyond Hangout by Startup Portugal of this year. My name is João Moreira Pires. I'm your host for the evening. We have a packed evening today tr uh, to try and make some sense of the Digital Markets Act and its implications for the startup world. And, um, and then also some pitches for, from, from some very cool startups. First and foremost, to bring us all up to speed, I would like to welcome Patricia Roque. Please give her a big round of applause. She's our head of community and communications and will give us the ecosystem brief. João, thank you. So welcome to the first Above and Beyond Hangout of February. Uh, no, of January of 2024, <laughs> sorry. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you all, all here. This is like the third year we're doing this and it's uh, a great part um, of our activity at Startup Portugal. We value community a lot, so we're very happy to have you all here today, uh, pitching and connecting and making our ecosystem grow. So today, uh, I'll promise to be brief, uh, and I have some notes, I'm sorry, but it's uh, a lot of stuff that we're announcing um, now for February. Um, we're, we're very proud to announce our Startups and Investment Matching, a conference that will be matching um, investors and startups, and that will happen in May from the 2nd to the 4th. Uh, tomorrow we will launch uh, the landing page and the first speaker, so I would say for you to stay tuned to our social media and our website to know everything about this conference. You will be able to pre-register from tomorrow on uh, and give um, the information about yourselves that we need to uh, then uh, register for the conference. February will be a very busy month, uh, also with Sim Circuit, a showcase that we're doing throughout all Portugal. Um, we're we're uh, doing showcases in the major cities of uh, the country and in this month of February we will go to Lisboa, Setúbal, Évora, Guarda, Coimbra and Viseu. So if you're watching us from any of these cities or if you have a startup or you are an investor in these cities or just want to be part of the community in these regions, please take a look at our, our website, register, it's a free event, and you can know everything about the startups that have been um, uh, given the voucher for startups, uh, and you can connect with uh, investors and other players of the ecosystem. Um, so, today, we will talk about the Digital Markets Act. For me, a very difficult topic to delve in, but let's see what our fabulous speakers will have uh, to share with us. I hope I can leave the, the, the session today knowing more about this. We will have here Gonçalo Rosas, Associate law Lawyer at Moraes Leitão, and Sergio Rodrigues, a Business Angel at Core Angels. Uh, and in Lisbon, Linda Capuza, uh, Operations D Director at the European Startup Nations Alliance, and uh, João Silva, uh, Head of Data and Standards at Startup Portugal, that will moderate this uh, conversation. A round of applause for them, please. <laughs> And now to start, I will uh, call João, who will present the startups that will pitch today for us. João, are you there? Patricia. Hi. Okay. Thank you so much for the ecosystem <laughs> thank brief. You. Uh, thank, we thank you for bringing us, bringing us up to speed. So let's not um, waste any more time waiting for the first pitch of the, the evening. I would like to call Michelle Martin, CEO of Maca Health. So come on, give her an applause. Waiting for the slides. Hi there. <laughs> there we go. Hi. So I'm Michelle. I'm the CEO of Maca Health. 
what do we do? We heal people and we optimize people, and we do that through personalized, preventative, and regenerative wellness. We actually launched our product in December. Uh, we went through Techstars London at this time last year, and are really excited to be in market in B2C and moving into B2B. But let's take you through what is actually a membership with Maka's Wellness Accelerator look like. So, oh. <laughs> so, uh, we welcome you in and do a high fidelity intake and deep DNA analysis and really come up with a whole health and nutraceutical plan and give you concierge level support from a team of 25 uh, curated functional wellness practitioners from around the world. Um, we really decide who's the best fit for you according to uh, if you have any chronic health issues, anything that's coming up in your genetics that's preventative, um, and make sure you're right on track to those health goals. And we have a focus framework. So uh, similar to how uh, startups work in Agile, uh, so do we. So we're continually iterating and improving this process, and it's really a longevity lifestyle. So we have uh, some great uh, early betas who went through and had great success. We have uh, had pilots in ADHD and women's health and um, are right now focused on everything sort of performance and longevity with those as our special streams. And now we are building. So we're here in Portugal uh, building a two-sided health marketplace from all of this data and all of these uh, transformational changes that are happening with people. Uh, we're building causal AI to really empower practitioners to have next level recommendations based on a whole uh, array of health data. Um, we are going to be uh, launching a raise. We've raised about 250K uh, USD, and we'll be doing a 1.6 um, in the spring and are on the path to profitability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was a very <laughs> concise pitch. And now it's time for Vadim Konstantinov, CEO of Spline, over in Porto. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm excited to... I'm excited to introduce Spline, excited and little nervous. So our mission is to make uh, virtual connections between people more human, uh, understanding and effective. So let's get started. Uh, think of about last online meeting you attended. And now imagine it's six months of the day. Uh, you might lose focus, right? And you are not alone. In fact, 47% of uh, employees believe that uh, online meetings are the most unproductive uh, part of their days. And uh, in, our real, in today's real digital world, it's true and it's a norm, but we have a lack of um, emotional connections in uh, human interactions. And this gap can make uh, misunderstanding, misconnections and less uh, team uh, efficiency. So our solution splines, spline, sorry, and uh, we use uh, advanced AI to analyze voice and face uh, emotions. So spline offers uh, real-time emotional tracking, uh, comprehensive moderator dashboard, uh, post-meeting insights, and that's all makes uh, every aspect of online meetings uh, effective and better. Uh, we believe that emotional AI market is growing and a lot of companies are working uh, remotely. Also, our technology can different uses from uh, corporate world to education, for example. So we believe in uh, big uh, growth. Uh, you can ask what uh, makes us different uh, from other tools. Uh, so while other uh, tools uh, provide you what's happening, Spline shows you why. So we give you insights and not facts. Facts. Our business model based on uh, subscription model and we cover small companies and large enterprises. Our team is dedicated to transforming uh, the way how we work online, how we live online, working. 
Uh, so what's next? We finish uh, face recognition part. Uh, now we're working on voice recognition and MVP web version. So in the near future, we will bring Spline to every offices, uh, probably to yours. Thanks. Thank you so much, Vadim. We now ask Alex Boulier, co-founder of Starting Box, to take the stage. An applause for him, please. Is my presentation supposed to be after his? We don't. There it is. Hi, everyone. So my name is Alex. Uh, I'm pitching you starting blocks. We are a search engine for data. Uh, for a bit of context, I first co-founded a first company called Happy Dev in 2015. We became the biggest freelancers network in Europe. So we're basically a web agency shipping websites or applications for our clients. We were a thousand different freelancers. We generated 15 million euros of revenue in the course of four years. Um, and one thing became a big problem for us was constantly finding available skillful freelancers and constantly finding f uh, new projects for them to work on. We had half of the leads that were coming towards us that we could not staff and two-thirds of the freelancers in our network but were not finding work as we were growing, so it was an issue. The solution we came up with is uh, we, we basically built a data search engine, a, a tool that was connected to the co-working spaces and other digital agencies in Paris uh, and, in, and in France, generally speaking. This was allowing us to see other projects and other freelancers available, so we grew uh, the pool of freelancers we have access to from 1,000 to 12,000, uh, and we we extended uh, our revenue by 6 million euros over the course of 24 months. Uh, and then this is what we are doing today. So we we realized that uh, interconnecting the different system of 66 com uh, different organizations, companies, uh, generated value for us. Some of our clients uh, showed interest for that. Uh, and this is what we sell today, the interconnection of different databases. We, we resume it as a search engine for data. Uh, one use case we have is that we work with the movie industry in France. It's kind of our uh, lighthouse project. Uh, we help them to save costs. One of the problems they face is that they constantly rebuild things that already exist in the ecosystem. They rebuild subtitles, they rebuild 3D models, they reshoot rush that already exist or they could reuse from other movies. And so we interconnect the databases of m the many different players so that they can save cost or resell the assets that they, are, they have already built. Uh, to give you an idea of where we are, uh, we have 30 clients. We generate 400,000 revenue this year. Uh, we have 80 plugins. I don't go into that. Um, we have just entered in due diligence phase this morning with a VC fund, so if uh, that sounds sexy to you, uh, please contact us. And uh, if you have data sharing challenges in your company, we'd also really like to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, now for, the, or for our final pitch of the evening, let's welcome Tyson Cardelli, Development Manager at CDISH over in Porto. Where is he? Hello, everybody. Wow. Uh, I would like to start with this sentence. Uh, information is the oil of 21st uh, century, uh, but analytics is the combustion engine. Um, is our main target here? Okay. And this is because in our experience, we realized that the big companies have 
three big necessities. And this is because uh, they really need, they always have multiple sources, disperse information and data volume complexity. At this case, we are cities. We are established here in Portugal since 2019. Uh, our headquarters is here in Portugal, but we have several locations in Switzerland, Canada, USA, Spain, and Venezuela. Okay. Uh, our, our solution is based that we are are uh, integrating different multiple uh, different data sources uh, we are enrichment the data and we are presenting that we call for our customer the 316 degree business view um, the main important thing here is that normally with uh, every company need to integrate these data sources need to enrich the data and need to present everything in the same place For this solution, we have different products. Our products are our DMS, that data management system, a CDP, a CVM, our marketing solution we have, and we have another solution for artificial intelligence. Well, uh, in this case, the benefits of CDs is that it's easy to implement. For example, when we have different data sources in a big company, we have the problem that we normally need a lot of time for implement any solution and if you want for example in your case to present data if you want to enrich your data and if you want to see the day the data in the same place normally you need a lot of synthesis a lot of systems a lot of platform at this case the answer for you is series we understand your industry your business and your data Uh, we potential. Uh, we are uh, imp using AI at uh, this case for um, for the solution. Uh, we are, for example, um, integrating some indicators of AI for giving the um, solution at uh, this case for different companies for creating um, the best decisions in their businesses. Uh, I would like to close with this uh, success stories because, uh, for example, we implement this solution in Banco de Venezuela. Uh, Banco de Venezuela, we have the opportunity to ingest, transform, and present the data uh, for more than six, 60, that nine billion of customers and 25 billion records for more than 180 different data sources. The um, most important thing here, it does we are transforming the data that they have for every data sources. For example, it's a big bank that they are using data for everywhere and we are presenting everything in the same place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tyson. Now, with, without further ado, I'd like to invite our speakers to take the stage. First in Porto, Gonzalo Rosas and Sergio Rodrigues. A round of applause for them, please. And now, here in Lisbon, Linda Capusa and João Silva. Let's wait a bit for there in Porto. Are you ready in the north? I think we are ready, yes. And the microphone is, is working. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you for the panels for being here. Uh, they're also in Porto. Um, this subject uh, it has been uh, uh, very known and very talked about in Brussels, in Europe, in the European Commission. Uh, but in Portugal, we understand that there's a lot to talk more and a lot to discuss regarding this uh, this subject, and then we, that's why we brought this um, for this uh, hangout. The Digital Markets Act—it's a new 
European Union law uh, that is looking to make the markets more um, fair and promote innovation uh, in Europe. So uh, controlling the gatekeepers, the big uh, tech uh, companies, uh, and allowing the startups to use the platforms of uh, big tech without being blocked in some ways. Um, here in the, the panel we have a lawyer, that's why I'm going to ask him first if I'm not saying anything very wrong. Uh, so my first question to, to Gonzalo uh, would be what is this act, the Digital Market Act, the DMA, and can you break it down uh, a bit for everyone to understand? As well, of course. Thank you for, for having me uh, this afternoon. Uh, although I'm uh, although I'm a lawyer, I will not make this very technical. I hope, but uh, and although it's a law, uh, I think it's very important for for you all uh, in the next few years because it will shape the digital markets uh, and the access to some services and gatekeepers. So, uh, as Roman was saying, this is what, what is a law is a regulation of the European Union, proposed by the European Commission. Uh, and the, the reason for, for its enactment was the, the feeling by the European Commission that it was hard to break uh, some access to uh, what they call the gatekeepers. So this, this is a, an act to, to try to regulate and to create fairer and, uh, and more contestable markets. Uh, what's what's the gatekeeper? So, uh, the um, the gatekeepers are um, companies. They are already designated that have um, a significant impact in the internal markets. They provide a core platform. Sorry, a uh, core platform service and um, uh, have a durable position in the in the market. Uh, so those, um, what's a core platform? Uh, it's uh, it's a list of services that we use every day, like online online, online search engine, uh, social networks, app stores, wallets. So uh, services that gather uh, service providers and and users. We all know App Store, Google Play, the Apple Pay services, all, all, all those. The gatekeepers are, as I said, are already designated, are all American. So it's Alphabet, slash Google, Amazon, Apple, ByteDance, TikTok, Meta, and Microsoft. And uh, these companies are targeting several ways in several types of services for example well TikTok is only TikTok, but facebook has facebook and whatsapp uh, apple has ios and the, the app store so different rules for these core platforms uh, imessage is still being investigated bing uh, also and uh, microsoft advertisement services so this is these are the gatekeepers and the rules apply to them. Which, um, which rules uh, apply? There, there are several rules. I try to make a summary, a block of, of regulations or obligations that apply to these, to these gatekeepers. So the first is around data and advertisement. Uh, for example, you cannot combine or cross use personal data uh, of multiple services without effective consent. We we're talking with before, and I let you talk about uh, the robot case. But this is was, for example, a concern when Facebook acquired WhatsApp, and uh, uh, Facebook and WhatsApp said to the European Commission, "No, we'll never combine personal data, so the platforms will remain independent, and so on." A few years later, uh, Facebook end up or Meta end up. Uh, combining the two services, and the Commission was uh, was really angry and and initiated proceedings against against Facebook. So this is 
this is from where this comes from. Uh, so you cannot also track end users with outside the, the gatekeeper's course platform without consent. Uh, you have to allow business users to access data that they generate in the in the in the gatekeeper's platform. And this means, for example, when a seller send, uh, sells something on Amazon, on Amazon Marketplace, they need to be able to access that data. For example, the selling data uh, needs to be uh, available. So the other, uh, I'll try to speed up, but the other, uh, the other set of rules is about the closed ecosystems. So, and this applies to, um, to operating systems, to, to web stores. So you cannot, for example, prevent uh, users from uninstalling pre-installed software. You have to allow alternative app stores, alternative payments. If you buy something outside, for example, at Apple uh, ecosystem, you have to be able to use inside the iPhone. So this will allow better third-party compatibility, interoperability with these services. So this part, I think it's the data is important. This, this interoperability and the opening of the ecosystems, both from uh, Apple and Google, are, are really important and can create several, several opportunities. If you want, we can talk after about uh, these type of obligations if this interests you. Uh, another thing is self-preferencing is a, a very, for us lawyers, very sexy infringement uh, in the last few day, years. And this is like these gatekeepers uh, give priority to their own uh, uh, products and services. For example, if you search something on Google, you'll see first the services provided by Google, Google Shopping, uh, and so on. So this will be for uh, from now on, at least for these gatekeepers, uh, for bid. So you'll be able to contest more users, for example. So this um, this is just the beginning. Uh, the last the last set of rules. It's also about interoperability, but here in communication services. So, for example, if you're only on um, iMessage, for example. You, can, you will be able to communicate directly with WhatsApp users directly in iMessage. So this is a long debated issue, especially with Apple, because Apple doesn't want to open iMessage and incorporate the, the R, R, RCS uh, platform, uh, protocol. So the DMA will force them uh, in the next few years to do that. Um, and that's that's a summary. I will not take more time on okay. on the explanation of the AMA. Thank you, Gonzalo. This is not the beginning. It's just the beginning, or what I understood. And I believe that we'll have a lot of more uh, things to come from this act. So uh, probably Europe will put more on top of that. Um, Linda, you represent um, institutions uh, that represents the ecosystem of startups in, in all Europe. Um, so this, of course, will impact, but what uh, do you think, why this be, is being introduced now? And, uh, well, uh, Gonzalo already talked about the, 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 the why is it mm. introduced, but why now? Why now? <laughs> yeah, I would almost turn the question around and ask why not earlier? Um, if we look, uh, seven out of ten companies globally, they operate in the digital, digital market space. So I don't think it's uh, any secret or any surprise to anyone that you cannot really have a fair competition or equal opportunities if there is a handful of players that are dominating the market. So I think um, this policy, this uh, regulation should seem as very welcoming by the startups as it's really there to support them. So the regulations part is for the main gatekeepers, as Gonzalez explained. So for startups and scale-ups, there's more opportunity, there's more possibility to innovate. And end of the day, the end consumer gets to choose which platform they want and also not being dominated by those couple of uh, big players. Yes, I believe the, one of the most things is the, that innovative part that allows 
uh, this this act breaks down some barriers that these gatekeepers have before, and so allow the uh, startups to well to innovate <laughs> their objective. Um, Sergio, uh, you're uh, an investor, so, but I will talk to you more in the uh, the, the opportunities that this app uh, opens. Besides what I said, innovation. But the opportunities that this opens for startups, then how do you see that in a, in an investor side? Um, well, I, I I have to check my notes because <laughs> one one thing I I want to to actually read and uh, console. I'm sorry, I'm 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 reading part of the act, but I think it's very clear. Um, gatekeepers will have a few obligations. Number five states, the gatekeepers shall allow end users to access and use through its core platform services, content, subscriptions, features, and other items by using the software application of a business user. This is basically stated. Um, this means that actually it's open to the world to use uh, data from platforms that at least have 45 billion users, million users, uh, which is like 10% of the of the total population of, of Europe. So um, the fact that we are able to access this type of data that was previous, previously um, uh, forbidden will create a lot of new opportunities because you, you feed that um, into the minds of the people. Actually, you saw that a few startups that, that pitched uh, today, they were basically around data, right? And so you, you are opening uh, the six, uh, or six at this moment, but uh, I guess it will be more, um, six biggest digital companies in the world. And so the, the number of data points available will be huge. Um, what will this um, uh, provide to the startups? It's, it's unimaginable. Um, I guess the number of projects that will uh, happen will be huge, unthinkable. And the types of projects that can be mounted on top of this type of data is is unthinkable uh, uh, again um now there are some um drawbacks um i i don't see any problem on on these drawbacks at at this moment but um one will be um increase in competition in a lot of uh different areas um uh but uh, Again, I don't see this as a problem. The market will, will sort this out. And the other thing that probably will be a problem for some investors um, is this will make huge exits more difficult. Um, there are companies that their exit will be uh, being bought by, by Google or Amazon or whatever and they will be stopped. Um, one example that happened this week was Amazon was about to buy iRobot, you, you know iRobot, the, 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 the vacuum, vacuum cleaners, and they were stopped because EU didn't want, according to, to the act, which is not uh, in place uh, at the moment, but didn't want Amazon to have um, the floor plans of the customers with iRobot. So um, there will be some exits that will not happen, but there will be, I guess, thousands or millions of new startups based on this uh, openness. Okay. That's a very interesting perspective. I didn't thought about the exits, but that's why we have an investors in here. Um, but it's, I think this is, is the, uh, a mindset of uh, the European Commission, uh, more in uh, opposite of what the America thinks in, in terms of law. But and 
this is part of a bigger uh, digital strategy with the, the AI Act, the Digital Service Act that will come next few months, I believe. And this, I believe, this will be in place in the in the end of March. Seven of March. Seven of March. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, but uh, Gonzalo, do do you see this uh, um, uh, set of um, of legislation is aiming to protect the customer, um, the consumers, or it's more on um, on helping innovation, or or blocking how the information is attained um, by these big techs. What do you believe it will be the next step? Well, uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> It's a little trickle-down <laughs> innovation or uh, that goes to consumer welfare. Uh, the idea of, of the, the European Commission was to make the, the markets more open and give more options also to, to startups. In the, end, in the end of the day, this will benefit end users, or at least it's, it's that idea, and I think we all has community have that uh, responsibility to to make this work and make use of the law uh, and try to create these new opportunities that Sergio was was also talking um, this is a european law so it's not applicable in the us although it's applicable to to US. to american companies so uh, if this works the us consumers will want what european consumers want uh, or already have so I, I think that will be very interesting, and, uh, and and I think it can have already a big impact. For example, sometimes, for example, here in Porto, uh, there's, for example, the trend the and then application. It's not available on iOS, and I hope next month it will be because the system probably will start to open. So I think this can have. Uh, uh, a good impact on innovation, on choice, on options, and in the end of, of co to consumers. Uh, Linda, what uh, is what makes this policy different from others? In, uh, in yeah, I think um, if you look at Europe in general, um, and specifically comparing to other um, geographies, so uh, the approach always has been to engage and contain when it uh, is looking at to ensuring there is a fair marketplace for everyone. Mm -hmm. So at ESNA, the Europe Startup Nations Alliance, um, it was created uh, with a mindset that Europe needs to be in the forefront of the global startup ecosystem. Uh, to achieve that, you need progressive regulation, you need progressive conditions. And Digital Market Act, is that's it. It's probably the most progressive, open and supportive package EU has created to date. And it's specifically designed to be supportive of the smaller companies. So mm -hmm. not encouraging the bigger ones, and but also they are still operational, still fine, but encouraging the smaller ones uh, to really succeed in Europe. So I think that's the main difference here. That's uh, always been a bit of a challenge with any regulation that it creates more bureaucracy. With this one, the startup scale-ups are actually having more opportunities, more innovation. So there is huge uh, chances to grab in the future. Okay. Uh, and what if, Serge, what if I don't work with these platforms? Uh, will this affect uh, uh, my 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 business, my startup, or uh, will it be difficult for me to have a big exit? For sure, for sure, <laughs> it will be uh, impacted. This is too big not to impact uh, um, all our lives. That, that's 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 the thing. Um, uh, first of all. Um, Again, you have open access to data that you don't have now, and that represents most of the uh, uh, population. Um, and when when you have that, and you will have open competition, which does not happen now, um, then all market will will be uh, affected. Um, Actually, uh, uh, it's it's kind of funny because if you look at at uh, businesses that are created 
to solve the existing shortfalls, um, then they will be negatively affected. Uh, there are a very small number of companies that are doing that. W one example is a quite successful company, a Portuguese company called Aptoid. Probably you've heard of it. Okay, so Aptoid uh, has success because it circumvents the, um, the, the need to pay a commission if you have an app on Android uh, Play Store. Uh, the same uh, exists with 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 the uh, Apple Store, um, w which is unfair, right? So they are just providing an app, and they keep like thirty percent of the of the revenue. It, it's it's unfair, and Aptoid created a market that is parallel to 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 the Play Store. Um, now, if that barrier stops, what will happen to Aptoid? There's no need for a, a, a free market because Play Store will be a free market. So um, even the ones that are not working with um, with the, the 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 products and services of the gatekeepers will be impacted either positively, and that that's what I and everybody hopes um, the impact the positive impact will be huge. But also, there there will be um, companies that will be negatively uh, affected. And, and Gonzalo, uh, uh, European law is sometimes difficult to uh, to understand what and what it impacts in the different uh, states. Uh, will it be any different if a startup is in Portugal or is incorporated in France or some other uh, state member? Uh, this is all for all Europe. Uh, Headquarters startups. Uh, yeah, no Cause... difference at all. It's because so, uh, sorry, I'm just... not going technical, but this is a regulation uh, and it's different from a directive. You might heard about EU directives that need to be implemented in the national laws. Regulations are automatically national laws, so okay. it's applicable in e all EU and. The EU law has a, a funny thing, is that this is not applicable to companies headquartered in Europe. Is the gatekeepers are American, are not headquartered in, 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 the, in the EU, and are the main companies being affected by the, by the act. So it's, it's uh, companies that provide services or products in Europe. So. American companies are gatekeepers, and all startups, even if they are not headquartered in, in, in the EU, but provide services in the EU or provide products in the EU, can, can benefit and can use the, the DMA. So they will benefit without needing to worry about uh, being uh, impl uh, impacted in legal terms yes it's, it's what we call the brussels effects of the of the regulations because it's it's not contained in the territory of the eu yeah, but also another question it, the, regarding the gatekeepers um, they at the moment uh, uh, is those ones that were mentioned the six i believe mm -hmm. but they can be more yes. in the future uh, if yes. they can appear a gatekeeper from, Port from Portugal, <laughs> would be great. That <laughs> would be uh, great. That would be great. But uh, from Europe, uh, it can appear in the in the future, in the near future. Uh, uh, yes, uh, okay. if they there's uh, some uh, I didn't mention the requirement, but there's a certain turnover, certain users, uh, number of users impacted. So if a European company reaches that threshold, uh, it uh, can be designated a gatekeeper. But just a, another note on the DMA, it's, it's a very re flexible regulation. So it's almost a blank check to the, to the Commission because the Commission can designate any company has gatekeeper as long as it's relevant, has, has a good base of users and so on. And even the, the obligations applicable to gatekeepers can quickly evolve. And that's why the DMA was created, because before we only had antitrust law. And antitrust law is very flexible, but 
uh, it's not flexible enough. So that's why the Commission uh, created this, this DMA. It's, it's a very flexible regulatory instrument, and that's why we need to start engaging with it. Oh, it's, as I said in the beginning, it's just the beginning. We have more to come. For sure. To, uh, we should have a look on this. Um, Linda, uh, what kind of opportunities can, mm. can we see? In, well, in startups, we are already seeing a few but even for our institutions yeah i think there's well, a couple were already covered but the the two two actually they want to highlight so the first one being data portability mm -hmm. uh, so what it means that the end users will have the chance to take their data and port to another platform. So um, in other words, it means uh, the end users using gatekeeper apps such as Messenger, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. they will be able to chat, message, call, engage with an end user on a non-gatekeeper app. I know it's a lot of technical terms there, but it basically means that all those messaging apps will need to speak to one another and you're not limited with the communication if you have or you don't have the app on your phone. Mm -hmm. Um, and the second big one, I think Sergio mentioned that as bit as well, is the uh, third-party app stores. So this has not happened before, meaning that the bigger app stores have to allow a third-party developer to install their own store on their bigger app, on their bigger app store. So meaning that in the end of the day, a new developer can create a store, install it in on the bigger app stores, and if it's a good success, they can uh, even uh, get the audience away from the platform. So that's that's huge. So I think there's it's clear for everyone that there is big changes coming, and it's probably the right time to, if you haven't already done, to strategically really think what it means for your business and which opportunities you want to go after because there are, there are plenty. So a lot of more competition that's as <laughs> well, but healthy competition as well. Yes, so everyone can have uh, their fare of the market uh, easier. Right. Uh, Sergio, just to, to wrap up, in terms of uh, the advertising landscape, uh, we'll also have fair uh, face of a higher competition. Um, how do you see this <laughs> this part? Um, well, uh, let me just go back one 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 second. Um, uh, regarding the the countries where this applies, uh, I just want to 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 do a small remark. Um, actually, this can have uh, an interesting side effect. Uh, if you imagine uh, an American company that uh, imagine a, a small uh, game. Uh, published on 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 an app store that pays thirty uh, percent commission and probably uh, is making like uh, one hundred uh, million dollars a, uh, a year. Um, if it it is based in US, it will pay thirty percent. Probably if it's based in Portugal, it will pay or, or Europe, it will pay zero. So there may be an interesting side effect of ha having startups moving to Europe um, uh, as part of this uh, package. So uh, a lot of things will, will, will happen. Uh, we still don't really realize everything that will, will, will happen. Um, uh, regarding um, uh, advertising, um, I, I, I'm probably one of the um, uh, uh, worst people to, to, to talk about this. Um, but I, I want to get to my notes and read another uh, obligation for the gatekeepers. And it's, it's uh, um, self-explanatory. It says, number four, uh, the gatekeeper shall allow business users free of charge to communicate and promote offers including under different conditions to end users. So this is, this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you can use their platforms to communicate with users. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of projects coming uh, on top of this. Um, it, will, um, uh, it will change the landscape 
there will be a lot higher competition, but a fair competition. You will not be competing with closed uh, platforms that can communicate to whoever they want, whenever they want, and knowing everything about the, the customer, while you outside, you are not able to, to do uh, such, such a thing. So it, it, will, it will transform, uh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll open the floor to some questions in the audience. If uh, there's someone uh, with a question. But Thank you. Uh, you please, mentioned several times. Please say the names. Just to, sorry, so to I'm, I, I'm Alex. Um, you mentioned several times that uh, to be considered a gatekeeper, you need 45 million users. Who and how is this going to be measured? That's a good question. Gosal, do you have? Do you know this? Um, yeah, that's. Uh, there's a uh, there's a procedure uh, so companies that think that uh, reach this turnover threshold and user threshold in the last uh, in the last three financial years uh, will have to communicate there's a form uh, to communicate that to the commission and then the commission analyzes and apple google meta did this and then the commission decides, yes, you're a gatekeeper, or, well, uh, you reach this threshold, but I don't think that you're a gatekeeper. For example, for iMessage, for uh, Bing, for uh, yeah, for Japan, it's it's being it's still being discussed. So the 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 commission has some leeway here to to decide what's who's a gatekeeper. But if if you reach the thresholds that in the EMA, uh, in the last three financial years, uh, you have the duty to communicate to the European Commission. It's it's a, a regime similar to merger control. So if you buy a company and if you reach a certain threshold, you have to get clearance from the European Commission or the national competition authorities to to, and it's your obligation to know. So the European Commission will be on the look. They're the yes. on gatekeepers. They are looking for a gatekeeper. Yeah. Uh, Francisco, is there someone? There's someone question in Porto. There's questions Still in no Porto. No questions here. There's oh, one there's one here in Lisbon. So let's go back. Hi. Um, so when do these laws come into force? It's Are seven, seven really? of March. So yeah, seven of ah, March okay. is here, and that's when it's fully uh, yeah, open, and that's also when all the technical nitty gritty details will be uh, presented on the European side. Okay, thank you. I would add that uh, you can start following the news because, for example, Google, the legal team of Google, already provided some uh, guidance on what they will do, and Apple gave some very controversial. Uh, guidance on what they will do uh, and for example for Apple I think they will create 600 new APIs to uh, implement the DMA and a new uh, a new fee structure for these and this is being very controversial so but there's a, a small post on on the Apple blog so yeah even Apple is still uh, fighting a lot regarding the iMessage service and all its not... It won't be as straightforward as uh, I think we would like to expect, but it will get there. Okay. So, um, well, it's there any other question? Oh, Alex again. But I would like to say one thing. It's, there's a lot of uh, fines set up for this. So mm, yes. uh, it's very big fines for uh, for these non gatekeepers. Yeah. So non-compliance, mm. uh, Alex? Well, uh, uh, I'm Lourdes, uh, and I'd like to make a question, if possible. Go ahead, Lourdes. Did, did I <laughs> interrupt someone? No. So, uh, my question is, how would be the reaction we heard about CSM of the gatekeepers? How they will, because they have a lot of power, 
and how it will do you, how do you see this someone wants to answer do, do you want to to start in lisbon or yeah Go we ahead. can we can start i think it's uh, it's a very good question and that's almost like looking in a crystal ball and uh, trying to see the future so time will tell there are some things as gonzalo said already that uh, apple is doing something that might be a bit controversial nothing is set in stone yet so i think more news to come and so even if you google dma uh, a year ago when it was still in in the process you could have a lot of information little things came up so little you could find online if you do it today you'll see how many articles are out there and how many of the big gatekeepers already are reacting and trying to fit within the new framework. Do they like all of it? Probably not, but that's not the topic we are here to discuss, I believe. There's been a, a great discussion, uh, in, even in, in news uh, from a long time, regarding what was going to be this, this act. But uh, I think that it's not over <laughs> no, yet. No, definitely. But, uh, Gonzalo, Sergio, do you want to answer some part? Um, just, just a small comment also. Um, well, um, we've been through several, um, uh, let's say, standardization of um, uh, services that come to be a, a, a commodity. Um, I want just to point out one example. Um, a few years ago, it was impossible to get access to banking data. Everything was closed, every bank has its own infrastructure, and so we, we couldn't uh, reach anything, right? So at some point, um, uh, um, they were obliged to implement an open API, and, and that completely changed the, the landscape. If, if you see the number of uh, fintechs that, that exist now, it wouldn't exist if there wasn't uh, open API because they, they rely on on the banks itself, but they, they are providing services that we, we couldn't even uh, imagine. So this is the same times probably 1 million. So this is as huge as, as, as that. Okay, so uh, open API for banking is, is a, a good example of the transformation. It's always a step. The foot on the door. Uh, Gonzalo, do you want to add something? No. Uh, no, no, nothing, nothing more to okay. add. Just to, to, to say that, uh, uh, just responding to the reaction of gatekeepers, the reaction so far has been muted, although the, the, new, the new implementation set forward by by Apple seems uh, seems there there will be some resistance in the rules, but I think the Commission will will react. Uh, the, the fines are are big for infringement, are antitrust style uh, fines. It's ten percent of the worldwide turnover. So imagine that of Apple or Google, it's it's lots of millions, and um, and yeah, and if you feel like that you're implementing the obligations of the DMA, and if you're not having a response from the gatekeeper, you can complain, you can use the competition authorities that can also communicate to the European Commission, and this feedback is important to the regulators also to see, well, this is working in practice or, or, or not. And for example, I saw the Apple response, and some things seem weird, but for example, they said that uh, you would need the, the alternative app stores would need a, a special guarantee uh, to made by, or granted by uh, AAA credit agency or something like that. Um, and an alternative app store said, "Well, actually, this is a difficulty, but I agree with this because in the last few years we saw that it's really hard to regulate uh, apps and content moderation so we can't have like uh, a guy just entering in the market and creating an alternative app store and that's it we need like this is a serious business so this makes sense so this this kind of real and practical feedback is also very important for us lawyers that we are all day in the office so this real world uh, information. I, I think you should 
uh, again engage and also with competition authorities and and even with the european commission thank you very much just one last question here in lisbon thank you um i'm trying to grasp which kind of data will be available so i'm, I'm understanding that there will be kind of forced competition on the app store that you will not be able to lock your users on an app store on a specific app store but you will ha there will be uh, chat messaging interoperability so uh, chat applications will have to be compatible with one another is there any other forms of data interoperability that is being enforced or right now is only contained to those two specific fields Good, great question. Uh, Gonzalo? The, 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 well, if, well, if I if I understood correctly, but uh, but uh, tell me if, I, if I'm not. One thing it's interoperability, and of course, the concrete API, sorry, that's the technical part that's, um, that we still have to see if it works. The interoperability, uh, there will be to need API, some information, but the data that will be available uh, will be data that you generate in the Gatekeeper's ecosystem, and that will be able to access more and with less cost. Uh, for example, your uh, the advertisement data, uh, the the, da the date of the sales and how much uh, how much users you engage, but I don't think you can lock users on a specific sure. ecosystem. Actually, the idea is that users are more free to go from an app store to the other. You don't need mm -hmm. to use only an app store. Uh, you can use apps. You can still continue to use the app store and the Google mm -hmm. Play, but also alternative app stores. I don't know if I replied to your it's, your question or if you can. I think maybe it's like you have more. Uh, you have the access to. You have. To, you still have to gather your own data, but you are uh, not blocked by uh, users. The, the gatekeepers. My, my my question is um, apart from messaging and the app store ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Does the mm -hmm. regulation forces gatekeepers to open up like other specific data or services other than messaging and app stores? I, uh, I have an example, one specific. Yeah. So, uh, go, go ahead. Contribute. Um, so, uh, Google Search, which is the only gatekeeper indicated in the search engine in, in Europe. So, they will need to share the search data, clicks, views, all of it that they historically never had to with another search engine company. So not publicly available data, not any uh, company can approach them and say, I would like to see that. But if you are a startup that is trying to get into the search engine business or you're a company that is not a gatekeeper and already have the search engine, you can reach Google, request the specific information and they are forced to provide that to you. <laughs> also, another example is, um, for instance, in, in Amazon, uh, you, you list a product and um, Amazon uh, has to tell you exactly how the ranking was, was calculated, how it was calculated, so that you can um, actually understand um, how, how that works and what data was used to, to, to make the decisions. So um, y you have to know exactly what, what happened. So everything that has to do with that, with that uh, listing or sale. So it's, it's quite broad. Uh, um, um, you have to read the act uh, several times because there are a lot of different uh, uh, points. Um, regarding data, um, it, it, it is clear that um, they want as much data as possible available, but on the other hand, as much protection to the end user um, with GDPR and, and all that um, for the end user. So the thing is, 
open the market to, to new products and services and keep that a private. private. Uh, just uh, if you want to go super technical, but it's not so hard to read. Uh, you go to the DMA, it's articles five, six, seven are the most important ones because they set the obligations. Um, seven is more for, for messaging, so more, uh, more uh, article five and, and six, but yeah, it's that idea of your, you can access the data that you generate with your service in the platform. So you can, uh, there's regulations for, there are obligations for data portability. Uh, so it's, yeah, Sergio was saying, it's, it's, it's quite broad. Okay, thank you very much. I think the, we have it all. So uh, let's, you, you will finish, sure? Yeah, I can yeah? finish. No. I can, thank you very I can much. wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for being here with us today for the first Hangout of the year. Um, a heartfelt obrigado to all our partners who make all of this possible. Ferroviário, Porto Municipality, UPTEC in Porto, Selena Nave is also in Porto, and the uh, 351 startup community. Uh, now I'd like to invite you all to go upstairs or in Porto to mingle there and uh, have some drinks. Patricia, do you have something to say? Yeah, I actually had, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so just one minute, I'll be brief. So I just want to share um, some uh, news with you. So Porto City Council will hold the first edition of Forum Porto de Economia on February 27th at Alfango do Porto. And this is an event that is aimed to highlight the economic development of the city, covering key dimensions such as entrepreneurship, investment attraction, talent management, and sustainable economic development. So save the date and stay tuned for more information, okay? Uh, and before we take part in the networking, I just want to thank to several partners that helped us with this uh, session. So Innova Gaia and Instituto Empresarial do Tanga, who helped us with the startups that uh, pitched here today. Um, uh, also, Selina Navis was hosting us here in Porto and Ferroviario, Aptec and the Porto City Council uh, for helping us uh, dynamizing like the the community here in Porto and Investors Portugal and 351 community that helps us with all the um, communication and sharing about uh, the event uh, in their networks. Uh, I would also thank like to thank Sograp and Superbok Group, who are the sponsors for our networking today here in Porto. So stay tuned to our newsletter and social media and check all the news on the Portuguese entrepreneurial ecosystem and have a nice drink.